Okay, welcome uh, to the session. And I'm going to introduce Sifa Giordano uh, to run her presentation. Thank you, Russell. So uh, my presentation um, title is What People Want to Know About Metal Hypersensitivity Before Giving Consent. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the unceded traditional territory of the Lekwungen people. I want to start with the story. So this is a, a, a case of a nine-year-old uh, child who was diagnosed with um, jaw misalignment of the jaw. In order to correct this, he was um, he had to get a device similar to what is on the uh, screen right here uh, to correct for it. So the impressions were made, and the device was affixed fixed to the upper portion of uh, his jaw and that was in place. Uh, the device was implanted on March the 24th. Shortly after that, what the parent noted was that there were uh, some rashes that was developing on the back side of the child's arm over there. Hopefully you can see my marking. And then on the lip here, there was, it was almost like a blister without any uh, filling inside of the blister. It wasn't painful. And around the same time, the child started complaining of, in his own words, my tongue is very, feels very bumpy and it was difficult for him to eat. And so at this point, he was taken back to the dentist where they gave uh, some sort of mouthwash and that mouthwash had resolved the issue. Also here in this picture, you can't see it too well, but there was a little, uh, was described as a burn and once the skin uh, came off of that area, it, um, it, as you can see, the base of it is a bit yellow, but there wasn't really any, um, any bleeding or anything that was associated with that. But as time went on, the parents also noted that, you know, on the lower extremities of the arm, the child would wake up with something that looked like a burn. And then uh, the progression goes as such. So the, you know, this is the first day. The second day, the skin came off and the base looks a bit yellow, but again, there was no weeping. And then the following day, that area just developed, begins to weep constantly. In fact, the child came back from school uh, with bandage on the arm, uh, saying that the arm began to bleed at school and the teachers weren't able to stop the bleeding, so they put a bandage on it. So at this point, the child was taken to uh, the MP for consult. The MP initiated a, um, a dermatology uh, uh, consult, and then the child was taken back to the dentist. And with this uh, discussion with the dentist, it was the dentist wasn't convinced that the child was in fact reacting to the device, but the mother was quite insistent that you know none of these things were happening uh, to the child until the device went in. The child also has a history of other allergies. So finally, the decision was made to take the device out of the child's mouth. And within uh, days to weeks, the, the area started to uh, close up, heal over. And uh, as you can see here, the result went back to its normal. Uh, there was some scarring there, but uh, for the most part, um, the skin went back to what it was prior to all of these things beginning. So what I just described to you is what in the literature is being noted as metal hypersensitivity. Metal hypersensitivity is a systemic delay type four immunological responses. So essentially what happens is when we implant met metallic uh, devices into the body, it corrodes. And in that process of corrosion, it releases metal ions. The metal ions by themselves are not an allergen. However, it can bind with the protein in the blood, at which point it triggers the immunological response that I just uh, showed you in those pictures. In the literature, it's been described as a rare event, but the truth of the matter is this event is actually very underreported. Uh, and some of the literature, recent literature, is showing that people who show uh, present with failing or poorly functioning prosthesis or devices, um, about 80% of them actually have uh, metal hypersensitivity. The signs and symptoms of it are wide. Uh, pain is number one uh, complaint, 
of many of the participants or many of the people with this experience, swelling, delay wound healing, and ultimately uh, device failure. As a nurse, I've been aware of this uh, particular phenomenon since 2013. And I was curious to know whether we as nurses, healthcare providers, healthcare workers, whether we were um, consistent or if we ask our patients about their intolerance to metal. So last year, or maybe it was a year before now, uh, I did a survey of healthcare workers just to see whether they were aware of metal hypersensitivity and if they were routinely asking their patients about it. And ultimately what we found was that 90% of the people that we had surveyed had no idea about metal hypersensitivity and they did not routinely ask about this when they were taking care of patients. This is even in a situation or in settings where uh, med devices are routinely implanted. And so with Arm of That Information, I uh, use a patient-oriented framework. And in this framework, essentially, I partner up with somebody who has had a lived experience of metal hypersensitivity. I presented to them the literature finding, the study, the survey finding, as well as my own clinical uh, practice finding to determine what would be the next meaningful question for us to investigate. And we de decided or determined that the question that would be more meaningful at this point would be to find out what information in retrospect, what information would have helped people who have had this experience make an informed decision about metal implants. And so we use an interpretive phenomenology methodology. We interviewed 16 people from across the world um, and they, uh, the interviews lasted generally about an hour to about just under three hours. And uh, I'll show you our results. So we had 16 people participate. Um, we did turn down uh, a few people, mainly because they were reaching out, hoping that we can help them find answers to their problem, meaning they wanted us to help them find doctors, uh, get tests, and what have you not. And so we, in good faith, couldn't include them because we didn't want to give them uh, a false hope. And so um, uh, participants were from um, North America, Europe, and New Zealand. Majority of them had orthopedic uh, implants. Some had dental implants as well. Uh, one had a gynecological and a couple uh, others had uh, cardiac uh, devices. And so their symptoms was very similar to what I just showed you. Uh, many of them talked about having uh, pain. Uh, a lot of them talked about having a, a rash that bled constantly. Others talked about, um, you know, being in their twenties after getting the device, having acne again that bled un uh, uncontrollably. So based on the interviews that we um, uh, conducted, we were able to glean at least six specific asks from the participants. And so what they have all uh, said was that in the consenting process, there was never a discussion about the metal composition of the device. So they believe that uh, as part of the consenting process, information about the composition of the, of the device ought to be discussed with the participant. Along with that, they want a pre-operative screening. So, um, you know, things around even the question, we ask patients routinely about their allergies to medicine, to latex, to food, but we never ask them whether they have a prior intolerance to metal. And along with that, we know that if we put two dissimilar, dissimilarly charged metals into the body, so if, if there was a, an implant, a dental implant that was positively charged, and then they put an orthopedic implant that is negatively charged, that can cause galvanization reaction. So what it ha happens is that it changes the action potential of the cells, and that can lead to pain and a lot of other symptoms that people uh, have. But we don't routinely ask people about what kind of implants do you have in your body that may potentially impact this new uh, device that is about to go in. 
The participants want discharge information about the signs and symptoms to look for. They also want an implant card. So essentially what was happening is that when folks got the diagnosis that of metal hypersensitivity, even the ones who were able to get the device taken out, later down the road, find out that there were other accessory devices that was left in their body. So that could be the clips, the wires that were used to uh, close the sternum. All of those things are also metal based. And so they want some sort of an uh, account that uh, detail all the things that were left in their body, as well as the compositions of that. They do want some routine monitoring. So this is a delay response and it can take anywhere from um, our participants have been dealing with this thing from like 17 months to one individual who's been dealing with this since 1985. And so because of that longevity, they, uh, before the symptoms emerge and the diagnosis are made, they feel that uh, a routine monitoring is uh, necessary so that they, we can identify the complications as uh, they occur. And ultimately, uh, there is a practice, an evidence to practice gap in our health system. So our healthcare workers are not aware of this uh, phenomenon. Uh, often patients themselves may not be aware. We don't discuss it. And so there is an, a need to increase the awareness among healthcare workers, particularly the, those in the outpatient settings, because often this is when the problems um, arise and uh, that diagnosis needs to be. Uh, made. And so in conclusion, we decided determined that people who are getting metal in, implantable devices are generally unaware about metal hypersensitivity, and it's not discussed as part of the uh, consenting process. The health system uh, in general needs to increase awareness and screening of metal hypersensitivity um, so that we can um, ensure that the devices not only do what they're meant to do, which is to correct or restored function, but also that if the body is reacting uh, to the composition, we can identify it and uh, give the participants uh, or the patients help. Ultimately, we can't do all of these things if we don't have uh, the health uh, information technology to be able to capture the information and then track it over time. The case that I gave you with a young uh, nine-year-old, there's nowhere in their current medical record that they've ever had this experience. So God forbid if this person would need something down the, down the road, we still not, would not know, the family would not know what composition of that device was the child responding to. Um, is there, and, and if you don't know what the composition is, you can't find alternative to, um, to that. And so I will conclude with the uh, statement that one of the participants had said in terms of their experience with metal hypersensitivity. And uh, she said, I have repeatedly found myself minimized, marginalized and treated like a second class citizen when I inquired about this little known uh, uh, issue. And so it's not just the fact, a matter of um, rashes um, or, you know, many of the participants talked about psychological impact of having to live with this when there's no diagnosis, no answers, um, and uh, even fewer people willing to uh, go back in there and take the device out. So on that, I will conclude and uh, answer any questions we may have. I do want to acknowledge my team, um, the patient partner, the participants of the who share their stories, and a third year nursing students that helped me with the data uh, recruitment and data collection. <coughs> Thank you.